Welcome to the National Council of Negro Women's 59th Annual Convention, National Convention, Dialogue on Racial Justice and Criminal Justice Reform. I am Davita Mathis, your moderator. I am a proud member of NCNW, the Greenville, South Carolina section. I'm an attorney. I have been a prosecutor uh, as my first job as an attorney. And I am especially happy to welcome our esteemed guests this evening. Our guests are Marilyn Mosby, the 25th State's Attorney of Baltimore City, and the Honorable Keith Ellison, the 30th Attorney General of the State of Minnesota. I'd like to thank Dr. Janetta B. Cole uh, for allowing me to participate in this dialogue. I am, uh, first of all, a law geek and law fan. And so it is a high privilege for me to be in the company of these uh, illustrious attorneys. I also would like to thank Janice Mathis, the executive director of NCNW and all of the staff of NCNW along with the board of NCNW for even allowing this dialogue to take place during their convention. Um, we've been talking about racial justice and criminal justice reform in our communities ever since African-Americans have been in the United States of America. It's been top on our agenda from the beginning. But what is new and what is different in 2020 is that the issues of racial justice and criminal justice reform are at the top of the agendas of people all over the world. We have talked about the multiple killings of African-American men and women, boys and girls by police, unjustified, according to many of us. We've talked about it for years, a string that's so long we can't talk about all of them and call their names. But we know that it's been happening for years and things have not changed a lot for us in that regard. But the new focus on criminal justice reform and racial justice um, has taken many of us by surprise on the backdrop of a historic pandemic, we were all forced to watch on television, seemingly live over and over and over again, the killing of George Floyd and the world watched. It seemed like it was orchestrated by a divine force that we were all forced to be at home and all forced to watch TV and to see a man be executed on television. So many of these killings have taken place either by video or in live video that we've had to watch and endure. We've become numb to so many of them, but our two guests this evening have been at the intersection of history, of our history as African people, as our history as American people, and in the history of criminal justice and criminal justice reform even racial justice, justice for all Americans. And we are so honored to have you. I don't, can't think of anyone else that I'd rather speak to on these issues tonight. And so I thank you for being present. And I won't prolong this conversation because I want to get to our speakers. We will hear from our spotlight speaker, Keith Ellison first, then uh, the Honorable Marilyn Mosby. Keith Ellison is the 30th Attorney General of the state of Minnesota. He was uh, sworn in January 7, 2019. Prior to that, 2007 through 2019, he was a United States Congressman representing the 5th District, 5th Congressional District of Minnesota. Um, he seems to be at uh, the precipice of history at all times because in 2007, we, when he went to Congress, he served on the House Financial Services Committee where it was his duty to oversee the housing industry, the financial services industry, and Wall Street. It seems like a lifetime ago, but in 2007, this country was experiencing a historic uh, decline in Wall Street. Also, uh, the bursting of a bubble in the housing industry, and those were the areas that he focused on. Prior to that, he served in the Minnesota House of Representatives, and he served as an attorney specializing in civil rights and defense law, a graduate of University of Minnesota School of Law in 1990, and the father of four adult children, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, and Amira. And I understand Jeremiah is in politics as well. He is the first African-American and first Muslim American to serve 
as a statewide elected official in Minnesota. And so without any further delay, the Honorable Keith Ellison. Good evening, everybody. And what a pleasure and an honor it is. I have such tremendous esteem for your organization. I just consider you to be a great inspiration to me. And I thank you for uh, inviting me today. I think we're at a historic inflection point. We're at a moment in time when if we meet the moment, we could change things for the better for our children, grandchildren, and people to come. And if we don't meet the moment, things can get worse. The fact of the matter is, is that there is no guarantee that we're on some linear line of progress. There's no guarantee. If you were to be back in 1868, you would think, wow, you know, things are getting better for us. We just got out of slavery. That's great. And, you know, we're getting the amendments passed, 13th, 14th, and 15th. 15 hadn't even been passed in 68. Things are getting better. We're hoping things will get better. And yet by uh, 1900, uh, the increase in Black folks in the Congress had topped out and ended. There was, the Black Caucus I was a part of was not the first Black Caucus. There was one during the Reconstruction period. And by 1900, there was none. And by, the, and by 1919, there was a period we call the Nadir, which is a low point in African-American history where they were lynching us one every three or four days, including in Duluth, Minnesota in 1920. And all of you know all about Tulsa and you know about Rosewood and you know all about that. And yet we had this other reconstruction that started in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And it looks like now Trump looks a lot like some of those, uh, those, those leaders in the late uh, 19th century who just didn't want to see any, any, any uh, increase in the rights of Black folks or anybody else and led a period of retrenchment. We, we're not going back to retrenchment. I'm not going back. I don't think you're willing to go back. But it is critical that at this moment of inflection, we understand the time, we understand the moment, and we understand what we must do. And we commit to resolving uh, that we will only, only um, fight for progress for our, for our people. And if we fight for progress for our people, then that's going to be progress for everybody. So let me start by saying this inflection point. Uh, you cannot just say, oh, the murder of George Floyd. As you said so eloquently, we have been seeing uh, uh, excessive force result in the death of Black people for quite a long time. And what we have seen is that despite what, what seems to be the most clear case of liability, responsibility, guilt, uh, it seems that it's extremely hard to hold these people accountable. That um, you know, impunity is how I might use one word to characterize uh, police use of force against uh, Black people, that they just get away with it. And you know that if you don't hold people accountable for wrongdoing, they tend to do it more. We know that. And so what we have is a situation uh, where we, we where crimes against us, violations of human rights are so often not uh, punished, not, there's no accountability. And so they just keep on happening. What I'd like to talk about today is Black women in particular in the criminal justice system. And I'd like to make one essential point. Yes, let's talk about policing. Yes, let's talk about criminal justice. But let's also talk about the broader context of injustice in our society, which I believe makes the criminal justice system treat us in a harsh manner. I don't think it's ultimately about the officers who used deadly force against George Floyd. I think the real problem is more typified by Amy Cooper. You all know Amy Cooper. Amy Cooper is the woman who said that a black man was going to harm her and her dog as that black man was doing nothing but doing bird watching. I didn't even know brothers did bird watching. I'm proud to see there's one. And, you know, he's just bird watching. And she's going to call up and bring, and she made a call. And she had every reason to expect that she would get quick, fast assistance, which would bring down 
brutality on this man, all because he asked her to obey the law. This is a critical thing to understand because it's not Derek Chauvin who's going to sit on the juries. It's, it's Amy Cooper who's sitting on the jury. Who's sitting on the jury? Who's sitting, who, is, who are the social workers who make decisions about out-of-home placement for Black people? Who are the loan officers who say, will I extend a mortgage to this family or not? Will I rent to them or not? It's not the, 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 the fire-breathing racists that you and I need to worry about. They tend to reveal themselves. It is the nice, everyday, ordinary folks who will tell us how they had a Black roommate, how they used to date a Black guy, how they... It's all these kind of folks who we encounter every day, who we work with, who make use their discretionary latitude to block Black progress and therefore, of course, are going to make decisions regarding criminal justice, which tend to maintain a vertical hierarchy of us on the bottom, them on top. What do we do about it? In a word, we've got to continue to press for justice, to point out the wrong, to insist on fair treatment, to make America live up to its promise that all men and women are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is what we have to continue to do. We got to use creativity. We got to use all types of tools to do it, but we must do it because if we don't, we have history to look back on and the history in the first reconstruction ended up in a, a very dismal period in black history. And with this guy in the White House, I'm worried. So can I see the first slide, please? Yeah, so the first slide is getting to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is we've got to organize and agitate for justice. That's really the heart of the matter. But before I get to what we must do, let me talk just a little bit about the situation, just so we're clear on what we're talking about. Second slide, please. Now, this slide just goes to show how frequently um, African-American women engage criminal justice system. If you look at the numbers and you look at the graphs, we often talk about Black men in the criminal justice system, Black men being treated, arrested, Black men this, Black men that. You know what? Black women are dramatically overrepresented in the criminal justice system. I think we've got to change our rhetoric. We've got to talk about Black people being overrepresented in the criminal justice system, having excessive force used against them, having sentencing be extreme. It is true that more Black men are arrested involved in the criminal justice system, but not by a dramatic number. In fact, Black women are more often uh, treated like white men in terms of the criminal justice system rather than white women. Roll slide, next slide. On my screen, it's very small, so it's hard for me to really see, but um, please, uh, to the next slide. If you could put, they don't need to look at me. If you can have the slide be the full screen, that'd be a lot easier for me. Can anybody do that? Okay, so here. There are about 1.3 million women under supervision of the criminal justice system. If you look at the numbers for black women, they are dramatically, uh, you know, they're dramatically higher. But, you know, prison, jail, um, if you look here, uh, you know, on uh, probation, parole, most are on probation and parole, but the numbers are, in fact, dramatic. And, but let me just say this about pro proba proba parole, probation. A lot of black women who are on probation, they can't vote. They can't, um, they can't uh, get into public housing. They, their economic lives are dramatically changed and their citizenship rights are dramatically changed. Next slide. So we have seen a decline in the rate of imprisonment uh, of, of, uh, of, of black women uh, between uh, 2000, 2017, but black women are still incarcerated at twice the rate than as white women. So it's still dramatic. Next slide. Yeah, and the, the, it's also important to understand that uh, black women who find themselves in the incarceration system are often victims of abuse. 
And I wanted to uh, bring this slide up because, you know, uh, State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby is a prosecutor. And she will tell you that, yes, Black people are uh, over-policed, but they're also underprotected. And often African Americans are crime victims, and nobody's held accountable for it. And this perpetuates suffering and pain. And sometimes I talk to African American law students, and they say, well, how come you want to be a Black prosecutor? You're just throwing your own in jail. I'm like, wait a minute, my own is suffering from domestic violence, sexual assault, and all kinds of things. This is debilitating, injurious to the health and welfare of Black women. Black trans women are also uh, are uh, often significantly uh, abused before they ever hit the system. And let me note that uh, if you look at um, about 80% of, of women prisoners suffer from substance, substance abuse, a lot of that is just self-medication trying to deal with the pain that they have gone through as girls and women. So uh, let me tell you, uh, chemical health treatment is Black folks' business, uh, and uh, Black crime victims uh, need our attention, not just defendants. And again, I was a defender longer than I was a prosecutor. I think we need to be concerned about both. Next slide. Yeah, so incarcerated girls, girls are disproportionately arrested for running away, accounting for 59% of runaways. They're, they're often fleeing home from violent home situations and not just violent home situations. We're talking about sexual assault, assault abuse and rape, uh, you know, and it's far more uh, acute for black girls. African American girls are three and a half times as likely uh, uh, to find themselves uh, incarcerated as white girls. Next slide. Yeah, and this again, uh, this is talking about police stops. Women are uh, being stopped by the police. They're being street stopped on the street, traffic stops. Men do hit more, but not by any means by some dramatic margin. It is women are involved in the criminal justice system. And yet I can assure you uh, that they don't have the same number of prisons. The ones that they have to go to are further away from their families. The ones that they, they have uh, the women are often the primary caregivers for their children, uh, and they are rarely accommodated in that way. Women, off, women who go to prison are often dealing with not only uh, incarceration, uh, but they're dealing with separation and also child protection. Uh, and men are, men are parents too, but they're not uh, dealing with that child protection case nearly as much as women are. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, black women um, were about 17 is more likely to be involved in uh, police initiated traffic stops than white women. Black women are at least as likely as white men to be arrested during a traffic stop. So, I mean, I think it's ironic that yes, black women, black men get the harsh brunt of the criminal justice system, but black women catch it too. In fact, black women are treated like white men uh, as opposed to white women who get um, the uh, least amount of contact in the criminal justice system when it comes to officer-involved stops. And yet there's a lot of statistics that show that when it comes to crimes like shoplifting, check writing, and a lot of others, that actually white women have higher rates than black women do. And yet black women get arrested more. Next slide. Use of police use of force. Uh, again, you know, um, black women actually experience a use of force during a stop about the same rate as white men, while white women use it significantly less. Uh, you know, Sandra Bland is not uh, an unusual thing. Black women often are the target of discriminatory stops. Uh, and this is an issue that we must address. We've got to disabuse ourselves of the idea that this is only black men. Next slide. And by the way, thank you for your assistance with the slide. But I, I don't want to just stop I want to talk a little bit about my own state uh, just as a case study, but I think you should look at your state. Uh, it'd be interesting to see every single state, uh, and we should grab this data and share it with people. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, we, we're talking about criminal justice, but I think it's impossible to discuss criminal justice without talking about housing. Why? Because if you have, well, let's just start with COVID, right? How can you shelter in place if you've got no shelter, period? Right. You know, 
and let's move on from there, that if you're unhoused or unstably housed, we know that everything gets worse for the family. We know that black children have worse test scores if they're unstably housed. We know that you're more involved in the criminal justice system. We know your health is gonna be more at risk. You're more at risk to mold. You're more at risk to lead poisoning. You're more at risk to nearly every medical problem. Housing is a civil rights issue. We've got to top line this. This is a very big deal. My own state of Minnesota uh, does about as bad as anybody when it comes to black home ownership. In fact, a Minneapolis city of has the largest gap between black and white home ownership in the United States. And mm -hmm. I can tell you this, don't think that what happened to George Floyd or, or Philando Castile or Jamar Clark or a lot of others is unrelated to housing. You know, the fact is if they residentially segregate you in one neighborhood as they've done here, and then you have lower, lower um, uh, quality housing and you're more unstably housed, you're gonna get more police attention. Uh, some sociologist has to do the correlation between segregated housing and excessive force. I bet you there's a clear line there. I can't say that I know the line, but it's there. And that's my anecdotal experience. Next line. Again, uh, the state of Minnesota as a whole, second largest income inequality gap, poverty among whites in Minnesota is about 7%, while the rate is four times higher at 28% for African-Americans. 33% of all black kids uh, compared to 6% of all white kids uh, are in poverty. So if you're a black child in Minnesota, one, two, three, that one's poor. One, two, three, that one's in poverty. One, two, three, that one's in poverty. That's the reality. It, in, in, the, in the, what, the way the police deal with our community uh, and the way that we and deal with, um, and the way where we're situated in the economy are, right, are very tightly correlated. Next slide, please. Education, same. I won't bore you with these statistics, they're there. But, the, but as I said, poor housing inc outcomes leads to poor educational outcomes. If you know, you, we talk a lot about the, the, the gap between white and black students. Well, that, that's, a, that, that's an important gap to pay attention to. Pay attention to this gap, the gap between safely housed students and unhoused students. Mm -hmm. And you will see even a more dramatic gap. I would submit to you that much of the racial gap in learning and education is explained by poor housing. And so we, we really need to dig into that. When Trump says we're not gonna let low-income housing in your neighborhood uh, to try to get white suburban votes, He's essentially promoting racial residential segregation. Mm. He's promoting um, le uh, le fewer job opportunities and lower test scores for your kids. That's what's going on right there. Next. Healthcare, same. Uh, black women, uh, and, you know, uh, are one and a half times, and American Indian mothers are 7.8 times more likely to die in pregnancy. Uh, I can tell you, I don't know about the states y'all come from. There's a, about seven tribal nations in Minnesota. And I can tell you that the way Native people are treated in this state is, is uh, abysmal. Uh, and a lot of Black folks have, you know, Native American relatives and history. And so it's, that's also something I think we should have some sort of a concern about. But uh, those are just some of the numbers. If you're, if you're sick, you can't work. If you're sick, you can't go to school. If you're sick, everything gets tougher to do and illness is a driver when it comes to impoverishment and being poor means you're going to have more police contacts next slide please so i you know look people like me come on to meet meetings like this and talk about how bad stuff is all the time i know you're tired of it i just think that we need to just make sure that we have a clear-eyed view of what we're facing uh, in my own state of Minnesota, I want to I want to talk about some solutions, but I, I know that most of y'all are not from Minnesota, so I offer this to you as kind of a case study because whether you're in, you're in Maryland or Georgia or California, I guarantee you the numbers might be a little different. They ain't that much different. So next slide. So one of the things that I did as Attorney General, well, let me just say this before I say that. Look. In 1968, there were about three or four black members of Congress. Now there's about 43 or four. It makes no sense for us to increase our participation in American politics 
and not impact the outcome. We don't need a black attorney general in Minnesota if all I'm gonna do is duplicate what the last guys did. We need somebody who's gonna be more attentive to justice, more sensitive to injustice, and to do something about it. I don't, all I can say is this. I'm not the only black attorney general. There are at least six others. One of them is in Kentucky. Well, say that. I'm embarrassed. And he's over here acting like, oh, well, you know, I'm just doing my job. Well, it depends on what you call your job, see? Because being attorney general is the chief law officer of the state whose job it is to promote the public interest and make sure there's fairness in the state. Just like Maryland's job is to make sure there is justice in her county. Mm -hmm. And you know what, it's, it's up to the jury and the judges what, what, acts, what happens in some of these cases. Right. But she will not be found not fighting for justice. And that's why I'm a fan of your sister, you yes. know, because you know, you can't always decide, you don't know, you can't control what the final outcome mm -hmm. of something's gonna be, but you can control what you're gonna do. That's right. And what we're gonna do is say that we're always gonna stand up for what's right. That song, the Black National Anthem, anybody ever heard of it? Lest ye, we are drunk with the wine of the world and we, we forget, forget thee. Mm -hmm. Right? I might have screwed that line up. No, you said it right. But y'all know what I'm talking about. What does that mean? That means, wait a minute. Y'all don't have to eat, uh, you know, dandelion greens and chillings no more. And you got nice, fancy college degrees. And you don't think that you got to fight for justice no more because your individual situation has gotten better. Right? Why did our people lay down their lives, man? Why did they die? Why did they face the dogs in the water holes? Just for you to have a nice bank account and a fancy law degree? Well. And a nice house and a car and some consumer items? To hell with those consumer items. We're in this for the fight, for justice. And I'm not trying to lift my people above anybody, but I'm damn sure not gonna let them be below anybody. We're trying to, we're fighting for justice in this society. So let me just tell you, solution-wise, when it comes to policing, before any the world knew who George Floyd was, I'm talking about last year, 2019, myself and the Commissioner of Public Safety, a Black man by the name of John Harrington, the chief public safety official in our state, I'm the chief law officer, but he runs, you know, the, st the state troopers and all that stuff. We jointly came together and we said, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a commission on reducing deadly force encounters with the police. Now, I'll tell you, some of my friends who are with, you know, to who some of my friends who are absolutely intolerant of injustice, they were wondering whether an attorney general commission on reducing deadly force encounters with the police was going to bring forth any change. And they they did what they supposed to do. They agitated and they pushed me. No, no, no sincere politician should be mad that they're that that people agitate them, write them letters, come to their meeting, make sure that they're doing the right thing. That's how we stay right, that we engage our community and we listen. And those folks came, we pulled together a commission. We had black folks, white folks, Native American folks, we had Latino people, we had people from East Africa. You know, we got a large Somali community here, and we had them all on the commission. We had police officers. We had prosecutors, we had the ACLU, and we came up with, uh, we had hearings all over the state of Minnesota, and we came up with key um, recommendations on investigation, oversight, accountability, prevention, training, and officer wellness. It was important to talk about officer wellness because if you're burnt out on the job, we don't need you going back to deal with people who are in the midst of a crisis, right? So that is important prevention, training, policy, and legal implications like the deadly force policy, chokehold policy, all that, community healing and mental health. We did these things last year. Before George Floyd was, was killed, we did these things. And we came up with this and we issued our report and that came out. Next slide, please.
Do I have another slide left? Yeah, key findings. 60% of deadly force encounters occur in greater Minnesota. Everybody thinks, oh, this is Minneapolis, St. Paul. No, this is in all around the state uh, where these problems are happening, not just in the Twin Cities. And here's another thing. 50% of deadly force encounters with police involve someone experiencing a mental health crisis. So we said, look, don't, if, you, if, if, the, if the person making the call says he's not right, he's out of his mind, he's got... And, uh, uh, autism, something like that, that information should get sent also to a dual responding mental health crisis team along with the police so that we can try to make sure everybody lives. You know, even if the person committed a crime or even, no matter what, let's live. So next, next thing, and I'm going to wrap it up right here because I'm uh, running out of time, but I just want to say um, that we came up with 28 recommendations, 33 action steps, and I just want to say that all of the recommendations we had around collecting data um, and requiring officers to intervene to lend assistance, uh, require, and intervene means if you see an officer abusing somebody, you, as a, pro, as a factor of your responsibility as an officer, you must stop them from doing it. Um, we, you know, we need to upgrade dispatchers. We came up with 28 recommendations. I can't go through them all, but I will tell you that we got a number of these passed through the legislature this last uh, term, and we're going to keep on pushing because we believe that you can, in fact, improve police community relationships. We can make sure everybody lives. And one of the most important things we did is we recommended reform in the arbitration system because a lot of times the chief would fire an officer for, for repeated bad behavior. That officer would go to an arbitrator and then get put right back on the force. That kind of undermining of the chief makes it hard for the community to keep that officer, uh, keep that chief responsible for making sure that we have not just safety, but we have human rights uh, observed and respected as well. So with that, I want to just wrap up by saying this. I'm so honored to be with the women who are at the very forefront of civil rights, humanitarianism, and goodwill in this country. I've taken more time than I should have, but I just wanna let you all know that I am only, I'm just so enamored and so impressed by being able to spend a little bit of time with you. I'm on this journey for justice with you and you all be well. And uh, again, uh, to my friend, Marilyn Mosley, all the best and thank you. I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much, Keith Ellison. He is the at attorney general for the state of Minnesota. Uh, you can read more about him. Let's use our phones for um, information and not for foolishness. I know NCNW members believe in that uh, because there's so much that he said. I took some notes so that when we ask questions at the end, I will be able to ask a couple of questions myself. But thank you so much, Keith Ellison. And now our second spotlight speaker, she is second only in position, not in importance, Marilyn Mosby. She was sworn in as the 25th state's attorney for Baltimore City in 2015. She is the youngest chief prosecutor in any major American city. Marilyn Mosby grew up in inner city Boston. Uh, she experienced the tragedy of her honor roll cousin being gunned down in broad daylight outside her home due to mistaken identity. She is a graduate of Tuskegee University magna cum laude graduate of tuskegee university and a graduate of boston college law school her first job out of law school was the office of the state's attorney for baltimore city where she uh, eventually prosecuted heinous felonies she left for a time to go to a fortune 100 company and then returned in 2000 with the idea in 2013 to run for state's attorney the head state's attorney she won that race, defeating an incumbent. Her name became uh, a household known name in 2015, the first year of her term, uh, with the killing of Freddie Gray. You remember Freddie Gray. He was the young man who got a rough ride in a police paddy wagon. And Marilyn Mosby, a young lady, first time chief prosecutor, had the guts and the courage to prosecute six police officers related to the injuries and the ultimate death 
of Freddie Gray. That was new to most of us. And I've been living a long time. And I don't think I had ever seen that happen until Marilyn Mosby had the courage to prosecute those six police officers. She's done so much in the role of state's attorney for the city of Baltimore. She started many initiatives, but one that is uh, so unique, I've never heard of it before, uh, recognizing that prosecutors have the duty to advocate for victims, but also have the duty to seek justice, justice for those who were wrongly arrested and those who were wrongly convicted. She created the Conviction Integrity Unit, um, unique uh, to my knowledge in prosecutors' offices to help exonerate those who are wrongly arrested and wrongly convicted. She is married to Nick J. Mosby, who is a member of the House of Delegates for Maryland, and I understand um, is running for a different office now. Um, and I believe that he has a very, very good chance of winning that office. They are the parents of two daughters. So many accomplishments. I don't want to take up her time uh, telling you about them, but read about Marilyn Mosby on your smartphones. But we're going to hear her live right now. Thank you so much, Marilyn Mosby. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so incredibly honored and privileged um, to the National Council of Negro Women, thank you for laying the foundation for me to be in the position that I'm in and for so many Black women all across this country. Um, I have a special love and appreciation for Dr. Thelma Daly, um, who has been there for me and my husband through thick and thin since the start of my administration. I have so much love and respect for this woman. I stand on your shoulders and I only hope to be the bold, beautiful, brilliant woman that you are. Um, I also have to give shout out to Attorney General Ellis. I mean, this brother right here, let me just tell you, I have so much love and so much respect for this courageous brother because coming out and doing the right thing is not always easy. And so I have so much respect and I'm just honored to be on the same panel. Um, it is so profoundly, right? Disappointing and incredibly draining, right? And I say this because this is the truth. It's draining to continuously witness what appears to be two systems of justice for black and white people in this country. We as black people are faithful and we hold out hope that justice is truly blind and equally attainable in the United States of America where we helped build this country. And yet our optimism is consistently met with exhaustive heartbreak and despair when we are constantly reminded of the injustice and what that looks like for black people in this country. Injustice for us looks like failing to turn or use your turn signal and ending up dead without any sort of accountability. Injustice for black people in this country is allegedly passing a counterfeit $20 bill during a global pandemic for groceries and having the life sucked out of you as you suffocate for eight minutes and 46 seconds, sitting in your home eating ice cream or God forbid, sleeping in your bed one minute and ending up dead the next. For black people in this country, there has always been a refusal to see our humanity based on the color of our skin, but the lack of accountability and injustice is something that we can no longer accept in this time and in this moment. In order to understand what's going on and to truly understand the indifference that some exhibit to the humanity of black people, the threat that we seem to pose by merely existing you have to understand the fact that Black people in this country have been dehumanized by the vested powers and the authority of the state in every respect of our existence since we were brought here as slaves. And historically, the police, prosecutors, the courts have been the enforcers of the state, enforcers of the conditions that have dehumanized Black people and kept us oppressed as second-class citizens for centuries. Police, prosecutors, and the courts 
where the enforcers of quote unquote people don't like to talk about it. Now they're a little more comfortable white supremacy. During slavery, when slaves attempted to escape the brutality of it, it was the police and prosecutors in the courts that enforced the slave codes. And even when we abolished slavery with the enactment of the 13th Amendment, America ensured that there was a carve out exception that justified dehumanizing the act of slavery for criminals. So police, prosecutors, and courts were once again the enforcers of those that became criminals. During the civil rights movement, it was the police that violently enforced the power and the authority of the state with dogs and fire hoses against children marching for the right to vote, the right to equally exist. During the war on drugs, it was the police, prosecutors, and courts that were the enforcers that imposed mass incarceration and devastation on communities of color. And now, police, prosecutors, and courts are still the enforcers of a system that refuses to see the humanity of black people. And we're reminded of this fact over and over again as black boys, black men, black women, no matter who and what we are or what we're doing, we are slaughtered over and over again on our iPhones. We see it, it's branded in our minds. So in, until we acknowledge and come to terms with the violent history of and culture of white supremacy in this, not just in policing, because it exists in policing, but prosecution in the criminal justice system in this country, this culture will never change. So why is it important, which is, I believe, in my opinion, important for us to understand that it's time to move from, from, from protest to policy. And I, it was touched upon earlier by my colleague but that fundamental right of voting is so critical. What we fail to understand is that our Black lives are literally at risk. And what justice means for Black people in America and our children and grandchildren are literally on the ballot as Trump has today decided to nominate a Supreme Court justice. And the questions that we should be asking, understanding and recognizing that this is going to shift the, child, the, the balance of power on the Supreme Court of the United States that will have an effect not just on you and me, but our, our children and our grandchildren. The questions we should be asking as we get closer to November is that any candidate for local, state, or national office has to have a platform on criminal justice. What are they saying? Do they recognize the blight of mass incarceration? Or do they have punitive approaches to crime? Have they spent their careers fighting to reform the system, like my brother, Attorney General Ellis? Have they gone and ensured right, that they're not just a, a political pawn for the police unions? Do they understand the racial disparities in, in our criminal justice system or do they profess to be colorblind? People have to do their homework and vote accordingly and not just for the president. And this is so incredibly important. This is what we're seeing all across this country, not just for the president, but to ensure that they are voting for state attorneys and district attorneys, whatever they may call it in your state. Those local prosecutors make a difference. Attorney generals, they make a difference that will provide us, those are the individuals that will provide us the justice and the accountability that we as black people in this country have been seeking for centuries. So my, I'll open it up to questions in a second. You know, one of the things that my colleague talked about were some of the solutions. Five years ago, I, I was confronted, um, you know, first in my first term, first four months of my administration, when an innocent 25-year-old black man by the name of Freddie Carlos Gray Jr. made eye contact with police. He was unconstitutionally arrested, placed into a metal wagon, head first, feet shackled, handcuffed. After his spine was partially severed in the back of that wa wagon, his pleas for medical attention were ignored. I followed the facts with the law and I wouldn't do anything differently. That accountability, which wasn't being had, it goes back to that word, accountability, wasn't being had in this country. And as a result of that accountability, that accountability led to exposure. A week after I charged those officers, the Department of Justice came in, exposed the discriminatory policing practices of the eighth largest police department in the country. That exposure ultimately led to reform. We now have a federally enforceable consent decree that even despite the Trump administration that tried to forestall it is still on record. And we can point to tangible, 
reforms that were put in place as a direct result of that accountability. Understand that accountability would not exist had the people of Baltimore City, had I not gotten the support of Thelma Daly and, and, and those established people in this city who said, no, we want somebody new. We want somebody that's gonna apply justice fairly and equally, regardless of sex, race, religion, or occupation. That accountability is what we need in this country when it comes to police and when it comes to race relations in this country and, 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 and ensuring that we are eliminating the white supremacy that exists and permeates in every aspect of the criminal justice system and every aspect and every system of our life and our well-being. And so, you know, I have solutions. I, and five years ago, four years ago, when I dropped the charges in Freddie Gray, one of the things that I said was that I can try this case a hundred times and without those systemic police accountability reforms, there are systems in place that prevent accountability. We, I can do this a million times and it would end up with the same result. And so we got to talk about the law enforcement bill of rights that ties the police department's hands from getting rid of bad officers. We have to talk about police investigating themselves and how that is not a good formula for a, a prosecution that is, is based upon the police investigation. We have to talk about the need for civilians to be on these administrative trial boards because guess what? They get convicted and, and, and then they get off administratively and they still have a job. We have people in Baltimore City that have been convicted. We've convicted 22 police officers since Freddie Gray. They wow. have been convicted and, and, and are still on the Baltimore City payroll. Mm -hmm. There are systems in place that prevent accountability and that's what we have to ensure that we're getting people in these positions that are gonna fight for justice, fight for justice. And so that the system is not just a system that pertains to just us. And so I look forward to the dialogue um, I guess the one thing that I, I would just point out is that, you know, the veil of ignorance has been lifted from Americans in this country regarding race relations and police brutality against Black people. And AP put out a poll and their measure was five years ago when I charged um, the officers in Freddie Gray. And it's, you know, we, we're, we can now boast in the name of change that Black Lives Matter is no longer controversial controversial term, which is never should have been in the first place. Um, you know, despite the traumatizing images of these murders that keep happening over and over again, thank God for iPhones, right? Thank God for these body-worn cameras where they're now taping it. These, this, this system existed and the difference is that it's now being captured and, and, and people can see what our experience has been for African-Americans in this country for, for, for centuries. And so the blinders have been removed from white America. Denial is no longer a choice, but there are systems in place that must change and our time to do it is now. So thank you. Well, I will take the privilege of asking you the first question, um, State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby. I don't think that a lot of people or a lot of African Americans realize two things, that attorneys general all around the country and chief prosecutors are elected officials. And as you alluded to earlier, uh, we vote those people in and out if we vote. So I'm asking you, Marilyn Mosby, first, emphasize to us how important voting is to a position like yours. So, I mean, prosecutors are one of the most important stakeholders in the criminal justice system. Prosecutors are the ones who decide who's going to be charged, what they're going to be charged with, what sentence recommendations they're going to make. They make a determination as to whether or not somebody gets into the criminal justice system in the first place. What we need to also understand is that, you know, 95% of the prosecutors making those decisions in this country are white. 79% are white men. As a woman of color, I represent 1% of all elected prosecutors in the country. And what we can see is even my, my brother here in the George Floyd case, right? We, we saw the exacerbation of distrust among a community prior to and before my courageous brother stepped to the plate, that local prosecutor actually invoked me as an example as to 
why he, he wasn't going to prosecute. And mm -hmm. what it did was after they started burning the police station down, he changed his tune the next day and basically said, oh, oh, oh well, we, we're going to evaluate this again. Yeah, I bet so. I bet so. Because that power is something, again, that's the accountability that people want to be assured, that justice is equal, justice is fair. And if you look at if Ferguson, and you look at Chicago, you look at these places, where the local prosecutor has come out and has not done the right thing, has not done the righteous thing, has done the political expedient and um, easy thing to do. And let me just tell you, doing this is difficult. Making the right decision and charging police officers, you, I, I, I received hate mail, death threats. I was mocked. I was ridiculed, not just for a, a, a period of time before pre-Trump, right, where I had Red Nation rising and they were threatening my, me and my office every single day, but even after, to this very day, mm -hmm. that is the reason why it still invokes in folks, don't associate yourself. My credibility and my competency was called into question for years as a result of going against and doing what I would not do differently and, and attempting to get accountability on behalf of an innocent 25 year old black man. And the fact that I fought for him. And that's why I say to Attorney General Ellis, this is not easy. This is this, your, 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 your entire profession is going to be hinged on you doing the right thing and standing up for a black person in this country and standing against white supremacy. And so it's difficult, but it cannot happen without you all understanding the importance of putting people like me and people and supporting people once we get here, right? Because the unions and all the other folks, they come for you and they come for me every single day. I, they did 30 stories on Fox this, this, this past month on me, right? They come for us every day. And so the importance of you all understanding not only to put individuals in these positions that are going to take a holistic approach, as, as, as Attorney General Ellison has already talked about, right? Like, you, 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 you got to talk about housing. You got to talk about education. You know, you got to talk about poverty. 28% of Baltimore's population lives in poverty. 35% of children live below poverty. There are over 18,000 vacant houses, 16,000 vacant lots. The unemployment rate for young African-American men between the ages of 18 and 24, which is more than twice that of, 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 of whites. I've come out and I've said, guess what? I'm not prosecuting marijuana possession. I'm not prosecuting uh, CDS possession. Why? Because I have the power and the ability to limit those interactions that can lead to the loss of life, especially when it's being discriminatorily enforced against poor black and brown people. And as the state's attorney, as the attorney general, the discretion that we have is that we can never be complicit in the discriminatory enforcement of laws against poor black and brown people. Thank you so much. Attorney General Keith Ellison, same question. Um, emphasize what's the important. She said it all. <laughs> she didn't say it all. You what she said. I agree Everything with what that lady said. said. Right. <laughs> and y'all see me amen it over here. But uh, talk to us about the importance of electing an attorney general, electing a chief prosecutor who can see the whole picture and prosecute crimes against us and exonerate us for crimes that we did not commit. Well, let me just tell you, uh, you know, just talk about criminal justice for a minute. The prosecutor is the one who makes the discharging decisions, mm -hmm. decides whether to take the case to the grand jury or decline them or not do them. The prosecutor says, you know what, we're going to make sure that we're investigating what happens to missing and abused black girls, right? That, that, that's reality. Tra sex traffic black girls, we're going to do something about that. We're going to make sure that a woman doesn't have to be afraid of to live in her own home because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, th these, are, these are really important things. And I think that, you know, prosecutors in general, and I'm a prosecutor, Maryland's a prosecutor, a lot of black folks think, well, you're putting your own people away. I'm like, well, wait a minute now. What are we supposed to do when the police commit a crime? You want them charged, right? Don't you want somebody, don't you want to make sure there's nobody above the law and nobody below it? Also, what about black crime victims? Also, what about black crime victim reparations? You know, in Minnesota, you know, we represent the Crime Victims Reparation Board. Mm -hmm. Some black woman, mom, get, her son gets killed and she don't have no money for a funeral or anything. Or if she takes off time from work, 
she can barely even go, you know, she's taking a financial hit. We represent that board to make sure that they're treating her fairly because there is a difference in treatment there too. We found it statistically. Now let me split to the civil side, just to the civil side. Now, so how many African-Americans suffer from economic predation? I'm talking about your check cashing. I'm talking about, uh, you know, Comcast charging you more or not even offering you the service. I'm talking about some student loan uh, gangsters taking your money, steering you into some high cost loan. I'm talking about the mortgage crisis on how, you know, you want to talk about, we, we talk about black wealth uh, and the, uh, decimation of black wealth when it came to the mortgage crisis of 2007. That's because we, they got us some of these high, high cost loan products. And then when the, when the crisis hit foreclosure hit our community harder than anyone other than maybe some other, some other Brown people. So in the area of civil stuff is very important too, because it's my job to decide, are we going to sue Jewel? Now Jewel is a company that is pushing these vaping products, which huh. are not healthy for teenagers. You know, if you're an adult, you may want to do it, but at least you ought to know this stuff's bad for you and give you might give you any number of diseases. So that's that's what my job is. I decided to sue ExxonMobil, the American Petroleum Institute, and uh, the Coke Brothers Coke Refining because they were systematically lying about how they were causing climate change. And if you don't know the climate change, it's brown people harder. Mm -hmm. I have two words for you, New Orleans. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and many, many others, and many others, many, many others. So my point is that as attorney general, you know, uh, and, and county attorney, you get to make critical decisions involving people's lives. We need to be more plugged into these races than some of the others, to tell you the truth. Oh, and by the way, Marilyn and I, are we have election certificates. We're not taking orders from uh, the governor. We work with these folk. They're, you know, we work with them, but we work with them, not for them. Right. And there's a very big difference. Am I right about that, Marilyn? You are so right. <laughs> That's a huge difference. Now we have questions from our audience and I'm not quite sure how it works, but I understand someone else will be working in it. So that's a good thing. So we open up for questions from our audience. And if our Zoom master will join in. Yes, here's a question from the audience. Would it be a good position for an individual like myself to stop racial tension when I recognize it? Is there a way to engage safely or set boundaries on my empathy? And we'll go in this order. Marilyn, if you answer first, and Keith, you come in, uh, sir. So I, I think that you have to, we, ha we are at a place right now in this country where you have to call things out, right? Like in, 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 in that moment, um, I think it's important. I think um, it's, it's also really tricky because uh, the president has created so much division in our country. You don't ever wanna put yourself in a, a dangerous situation but if you're in a situation and when you feel comfortable and it, these are maybe your colleagues or in a professional setting or a setting in which you feel like you can make that sort of um, that, that check, right? Like you can say, hey, I'm calling you out and this is how this, this, you have just said this and I think that it's evoking this. I think that that's appropriate, but I do caution you to be careful because you do have some extremists and we've seen that um, play out across the country um, as, you know, white supremacy, white supremacists uh, are, I think, one of what they've been deemed, one of the number one sort of terror groups in the country. So you have to really watch it, right? But not be fearful to be able to call things out when you feel that you're, 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 you're safe and, and able to do so. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think you ought to speak up when you see um, racial injustice, when you see abuses. I would say don't just confine yourself to the overt expressions, but like when you see systematic and institutional unfairness, you got to speak up on that too. So, yep. Thank you. Great question. Next question, please. How do you move past the anger of all the injustice around us? I'm seeing so many things on social media and it's hard not to respond. 
And we'll go in that same order. Um, I think we have to, for me, it's so much greater than me. Like, and I can, I talk kind of about my own sort of personal experience and attempting to apply and have accountability against police officers. But one of the things that I understood and recognized having gone through all that I did, I mean, they published my children's photos in the, in the paper at the height of, of my death Mail, the hate mail and death threats that we were receiving, you know, they described, they wrote a letter and described how my husband would be killed coming out of my house in an obituary and how no police would respond. Um, it's easy, right, to, to think about um, your own personal sort of sacrifice that you make in these situations. But one of the things that always kept me grounded um, and to this day still keeps me grounded is that it's always been bigger than me. Right? Like it was never about Marilyn Mosby. It was about what Marilyn Mosby represented. And after I was elected and after I made the decision, I inspired other black women to run to be prosecutors. Aramis Ayala, Kim Fox, Sherry Boston, you know, Kim Gardner. Uh, it, the list goes on. It, 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 you have um, Rachel Rollins, right? Like these were all black women who were subsequently elected to this role and who are making these major sort of progressive reforms in their respective jurisdictions. And so if you're able to understand like it's bigger than you and you're in this fight, the division that we're facing as a country is going to hopefully make us a better country, right? The protests, the Black Lives Matter movement, like we had to go through and experience pain to turn that pain into passion to pursue our purpose. And so if you, you think of it that way, like we're going to be a better country. We, we may have use of force and de-escalation policies federally, right? Like the, 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 the police accountability reform that's being proposed federally, statewide. You have to think about the, the, the positive, positivity coming out of a very, very tragic sort of circumstance. And so if you can think that way, I think that's what helps me. Um, in this moment and, and but i also understand that it's imperative that we get this individual out of out of office um, that is leading our country in the wrong direction you know what i'd recommend to people is one do not respond to the trolls you know if, if you're on social media somebody calls you a so-and-so just either mute them or it block them and Keith, that's hard to do. That's and, really hard to do sometimes. <laughs> but like, well, so like the thing is now, I don't know if you and I can legally block them. We might have to just mute them, right? Because they say if you're an elected official, you might not be able to block these uh, people. But, sometimes I block a whole lot of folks, so we'll see. <laughs> well, you know, but the thing is better to just mute them or block them. Go on, playing verbal tennis with these clowns, it's you got, you, life is short, you got better things to do. So, and then on social media, you know, um, I would say that, you know, just always say something that you feel that is helpful or informative uh, and, and I'll kind of keep strict rules to that because if you do, if you're always coming a certain kind of way and those other folks are coming another kind of way, your folks will defend you, right? So I'd say that, you know, there's certain protocols on managing social media, this new world we're living in. It's important to do that. Uh, in terms of how I manage this stuff, look, you know what? My grandfather was organizing black voters in rural in Natchitoches Parish, Louisiana in 1952 and three. Mm. And they threatened to kill him so much that they had to send my mom to boarding school in Lafayette, Louisiana, because they, they were just that certain that they might try to blow up the house. They burned a cross in front of the house. Oh. They refused to sell him gasoline. They called up the house and say, we got that end tied up to a tree. He ain't coming home tonight. And they wouldn't have him there. They just wanted to terrorize my grandmother. So that's the kind of people who raised me. So when these folks call me and send me all their little stupid stuff, I'm like, man, whatever, man. I'm easy to find. I just cannot uh, succumb to that, right? And, and so I have been convinced by my loved ones, you know, that I should take precautions. So I do, but you know, um, you know, uh, but I don't, I don't spend no time staying up at night on these threats from these bullies and I never will. So that's all I got to say about it. 
Thank you. Great question. Are there others? Yes, for Ms. Mosby or Attorney Mosby. Can you, can you speak about the sisterhood of Black female prosecutors and how you have supported each other? I, I, I appreciate that question. Um, I can tell you that it has been a goal of mine, having gone through what I went through in 2015. It can be incredibly isolating, especially when you go up against a system and you represent 1% of all elected prosecutors in, in the country. You don't necessarily have um, or feel like you sometimes feel so isolated on an island by yourself. People, don't get me wrong, I had my folks in, in the communities, they would be like, I got your back, I got your back, I got your back. You turn around, you'd be like, y'all mugs must be way back because I don't see nobody. <laughs> and they put you through the ringer. And so, and it was for a while. Um, and, but one of the things that I did in that particular sort of um, situation was that I, I made a vow to myself understanding and recognizing that my my race and, and my sex and my age all played into the type of coverage that I was receiving, how, you know, it, it, it became all about me as opposed to this innocent 25-year-old man from West Baltimore that made eye contact with police and ended up dead. And so, you know, one of the things that I said was, I, I want to I want other women to be in this role and to do this type of work, but I don't ever want them to feel as isolated as I do because it was, it was, it's draining, right? It, it's a sacrifice. I have two little girls, you know, from, from being a mom and to my husband who's in politics, like they got the brunt of a lot of the, the pressures of, of that job and the, and the pressure of me actually doing and taking the stance that I did. And so, you know, when these black women prosecutors started getting elected all across the country, you know, I, I made it a point to reach out to them. Um, and to, I served on Kim Fox's transition team, you know, um, and as soon as we found out that additional prosecutors, black women prosecutors were gonna be elected, we are part of a, an organization called Fair and Just Prosecution, and as well as the Fair um, Institute of Justice, actually call us together. We have like a text thread where we vent we cry, we laugh, you know, we support one another in a way that empowers us to continue to do this type of work. You know, you look at Aramis Ayala, who's the first black state attorney in Orlando, Florida, who is receiving an, a noose to her office, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because she came out against the death penalty and the, the governor was then ripping away and calling into question her discretion. You know, we together were able to support that system. You got Kim Gardner, you know, I went out to St. Louis and at the beginning of the year, this is a sister who's been under attack by the fret, the fraternal order of police and, and, the, and the city hall and the mayor. I mean, they have come at her with everything because she attempted to hold the governor accountable and use her discretion, right? And, and, and in a way that had one standard of justice. They have done so much to this woman. And then finally, Kim Gardner said, I'm, a, I'm pushing back. I'm gonna sue you and Fraternal Order of Police. And so mm -hmm. I went to stand with that sister and it's so crazy because as soon as I got home, I got this nasty racist um, voice message that described me as all types of N words and don't you come out here. I mean, and but that's that's our reality, right? And so that in and of itself can be draining because we're, we're, we're wives, we're mothers on top of the job that we do. And so we, we have to have some level of, 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 of comfort and that's what we find in each other. And so I'm, I'm grateful for my network of sisters, Stephanie Morales, I gotta give her a shout out. 2015, she was a sister out of Portsmouth, Portsmouth Virginia that tried a white police officer for the killing of a black man and actually got a conviction. You know, this is what we do. We attempt to support one another. And I made that vow when I was going through that experience, that incredibly isolating experience myself. Thank you. That Thank goes. you. Next question. I believe those are all the questions. Well, I have a million questions, but I won't get to ask all of them tonight. Um, I, I think in general, African-American people don't understand that every case that is charged is not prosecuted. And that might be a factor in their realizing how important your role as uh, state's attorney and your role as attorney general are. Uh, in my experience, way back in the 1400s when I was an assistant prosecutor, uh, 
most cases in South Carolina were not prosecuted. And the person who made the decision whether to prosecute a case or whether not to prosecute a case was what we call a solicitor or state's attorney or assistant state's attorney. And since 25 of the state's attorneys in the office where I work were white and two were black, the white people got the breaks. The elected official was white and 25 of the assistants who worked for him were white. The white people got the breaks. But when black people, two of us, and there, I think there's like one or two now, 25 years later, 30 years later, um, we could see a picture where a black person might need a break, not just need a break, but deserve a break. Um, talk about the prosecutor's role and discretion in determining who is prosecuted and how they are prosecuted. So the one thing I can say, and I kind of already briefly mentioned it, right, is that power, that awesome amount of, of power and discretion, 95% of those individuals making those decisions are white in this country right now in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. And so their life experiences are, are vastly different than, you know, the 1% of black women. I don't need cultural sensitivity and implicit bias training to know how young boys yeah. like Freddie Gray um, were treated by police in not just Baltimore, but all across every municipality across, across the nation. But that power and that discretion, because it's been um, yielded um, for black, for, for, for white men, especially, mm -hmm. white people overall, but white men especially, that discretion is often challenged when it's somebody that is, is non-white, right? And I'm sure Attorney General uh, Ellison is, is dealing with this now. <laughs> that, that's, they challenge that in a way that, um, again, they call into to question for me as a black woman, the first thing they do is they call into question your competency, which is which is crazy. Not the systems that are preventing police accountability, not the fact that a grand jury has, has agreed that we have probable cause that these individuals have committed an offense. They call into question your competence. And so understanding that that's always going to be the issue, whether that was Kim Fox, when she decided she wasn't going to do prosecute Jesse Smollett, or whether that was Erin Masala and saying she's not going to prosecute death penalty cases. Once you recognize that that's always going to be the issue, and for me, I feel like they they created the playbook and they perfected it. They they created playbook with me and then perfected it with everybody else. You, you, you can't, I'm not accountable. As, as, as Keith has already said, I'm not accountable to the, the governor. I'm not accountable <laughs> to, to the mayor or a city council. I am accountable to the people who have elected me, right? And they have elected me because they believe in my judgment and my, the power of my judgment. So when the state delegates and the governor come out against me, when I look at the ACLU reports and they, they understand and recognize that when you the possession of marijuana in, in the United States, you're four times more likely to be arrested if you're black, right, for possession of marijuana than a white person. There's no disparate use among white and black people when it comes to, to using that drug, but That's there's a disparate sort of impact on the enforcement and putting people in jail. In Baltimore City, you were six times more likely to be to be arrested for possession of marijuana. And then even after we decriminalized 10 grams or less in this state, when you look at the data, the first year that we decriminalized it, 89% of the citations that they were issuing were issued to Black people. Right. 2017, 94%. The following year, 95% of the citations that they were issuing were issued to Black people. And what was even more troubling was the fact that we have nine police districts, but 42% of the citations were being issued in one police district, which happened to be the same district that Freddie Gray grew up in and was raised in in West Baltimore. So that, that district, which happens to be 95% black and disproportionately impoverished. And what that tells me is that you're not focusing on Tommy in, in the inner harbor, right? In, in the white areas, you're focusing on Tyrone. And I cannot be discriminatory. I'm never going to be complicit in discriminatory enforcement of, of laws against poor black and brown people. And so I'm using my discretion now to say, guess what? We're not prosecuting possession of marijuana, regardless of amount, because that's what they'll say. Oh, well, this is a whole lot that justified. And regardless of criminal history, 
No, you're not going to focus on Tyrone anymore because Tyrone has 17 other marijuana arrests because you've been focusing on him and not anybody else. I've come out during COVID and said we have to, after consulting with the experts, legal experts, and said we have to ensure that we are depopulating our prisons and our jails so that we can actually hold the violent individuals there, right? We don't, we're, we're creating an environment where uh, you have, uh, Eric, what is his name? Uh, loose cigarette. He, he he lost his life over a loose cigarette. We, he, um, Eric Garner. Eric Garner lost his life over a loose cigarette. Sandra Bland over not putting on a turn signal, right? Like we have got to reevaluate the way that we're using and policing in this country. And as prosecutors, we have that discretion to do that. And you know, you're in the uh, system. Yes. Let me just say that, you know, um, Marilyn has very correctly pointed on the initial contact people have with police, but prosecutors have a lot of discretionary discretion on the back end too. I mean, when it comes to exonerees, you know, there's a, the black people are convicted of murder and sexual assault significantly more likely than their white counterparts mm -hmm. to be found innocent later, right? right? So the exoneree, you know, the fact is, you're, you know, because black people are targeted for criminal law and criminal justice enforcement, the cases tend to, they are contacted more. The cases are statistically, you know, weaker. Not that they're weak on everyone, but like overall. And then that means there's more black exonerees. And so, but if, but, but like, you've got to be the kind of person who's going to have a conviction integrity unit. Uh, I'm following and Maryland's good example. We just started a conviction integrity unit at the Minnesota Attorney General's office like just two weeks ago. We got the money for it. We're rocking. And so my point is that that is another phenomenon. People who have the criminal justice system has failed, you know, like like say, like say the uh the Central Park Five. You know, how many folks? didn't do it, but there's a mass hysteria. Somebody gets charged, somebody gets arrested, somebody gets convicted. And are they ever gonna get their post-conviction relief that they should get? That is also something within discretion. You know, do you fight the thing to the last or do you say, okay, wait a minute, let's at least retry it if there's some doubt. And so these, these are other critical issues that folks need to consider. How many people in America, including black people, have somebody in prison and their family who they're like, you know, I just know they didn't do that. I got people over here saying that they were over here, but nobody's listening. You know, so that's another piece of this that does involve discretion. Um, you know, you know, as attorney general, again, we're talking a lot about criminal justice. I also want to say the discretion to confront um, economic predators yes. and, and, and stop the draining of the African-American family budget, you know, from just fraudsters and crooked practices. And, you know, uh, th this is another thing that is a discretionary matter. We sue who we decide to sue, you know, and right now I can tell you this, we're looking at, um, we're looking at the fact that so many black women do not get adequate prenatal care. They don't get the vitamins, they don't get the checkups, they don't get, and then, you know, there's this really an epidemic of black women dying in childbirth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, infant, you know, uh, women dying in childbirth, disproportionately African-American. And, you know, the system, the healthcare system says, well, these are non-compliant people. They smoke their way too much. There's all these problems. Well, wait a minute. First of all, is that even true? Because I doubt, I challenge the truth of that. And then even if in some cases it is true, what are you doing to help her lose weight? What are you doing? Where do you have smoking cessation programs in this community or only over there? Right? So these are all things that involve discretion. Who are you going to sue? When are you going to sue them? And, and what do you, and, and on whose behalf? And then the last thing I want to mention, we've been interrogating ourselves at the Minnesota Attorney General's office to ask ourselves, do people even know that they can call us? if they feel their landlord is ripping them off, if they feel that they're being cheated, if they, you know, we need to know from a consumer, we do a lot of consumer protection. We need to help people understand that we are available to them. So we've been putting a lot of energy into making sure they are aware that's a matter of discretion. 
Because if we're not in the black community, if we're not on the Native American reservation, if we're not in the uh, where the Somali community is, well, they're getting ripped off and nobody even know and nobody even knows where to turn. So there's a lot of discretion we have. So one more reason why these races are key for, for our community. Well, thank you so much. I need to ask the conveners uh, if we have a little more time or do we have to stop now? We started a little late, but I know you have a program that needs to keep moving forward. And I promise you, I got more questions. Um, I see some little bobbing heads. I think this might be the end for us. I want to thank you, Keith Ellison, Attorney General for the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Marilyn Mosby, State's Attorney for the Baltimore City. Thank you for your service, your quest for justice, for your effectiveness, and thanks for running, because a whole lot of people wouldn't do it. But we appreciate you. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and we're glad that you're fighting on our side. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our NCNW members, conveners, participants, uh, Dr. Cole, and all the staff. Thank you. Good night. Before you close out, before you close out, I would like to say just a word of thanks. We were remiss in not introducing you when you began this. You did a wonderful job moderating, and we appreciate it. Oh. Davida Mathis is an attorney with decades of experience in her own right. She was the first Black female prosecutor in the state of South Carolina. She's since been in private practice. She's an accomplished musician and actress. And I think sometimes one of the reasons she's such a good lawyer is because she was such a good actress. Uh, she's a graduate of Oberlin College. She's a graduate of the University of South Carolina School of Law. And of course, some of you may have guessed that she is my sister. Marilyn Mosby, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you. Keith Ellison, it's been a while since we've seen each other. Thank you for doing this. The test of this is that tonight there are half a dozen young men who are helping us with the technology. And they sort of all day sort of, you know, watch some of our programming and didn't, didn't watch others. But when you two public servants started to talk about criminal justice in ways that affect their lives every time they go outside, they watched the entire program with rapt attention. Thank you, God bless you to continue doing the work that you're doing and NCNW is here if you need us and we're gonna be in that struggle for justice with you. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce somebody who needs no introduction. Marilyn, as you said, especially in Baltimore, in Maryland or anywhere on the East Coast, she uh -huh. is the vice president of our organization. She is the 16th national president of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, which I am a proud 40 year member um, and she will take us the rest of our way through our program as we introduce our president, whose state of the organization message will be the next thing that you hear. Thank you all and good night. Thank you, Ms. Mathis, and thank you to those who have spoken tonight. I'd like for all of the delegates that this is still a plenary session, and we are asking you to stay in place. And since you are home, you know, you can kick off your shoes. Are we still on? Am I on? Yes. I am on. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, so this is still a plenary session. And so in a few moments, we are going to hear the state of the organization from our national president. You know, there's a protocol involved in this. And we didn't do it on the first day. And I was scheduled to introduce the president. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in my own way, because that is protocol as we get ready for our president to give her message. So the theme is for such a time as this. And I would say for such a time as this, the world needs great leaders. And for us in NCNW, we have one of the greatest leaders of our time. She has the indomitable vision of Mary McLeod Bethune, and she has the tenacity of a Dorothy Height. Like Dorothy Height and Dr. Bethune, she has traveled 
and affected people in Africa and India and all across this country. And she crossed over bumpy roads and small roads and she is master all. Dr. Daly, you are on mute. You put yourself on mute. Okay, am I okay now? Yes. Her brilliant scholarly work at Oberlin College led her to go home to her parents and say to her parents, I'm going to be an anthropologist. And they said, what? And she became an anthropologist when very few people have ever heard of a black woman majoring in anthropology. And she has become one of the outstanding anthropologists in this country. She has not even, not only taken the hinges off of doors, but she has opened doors wide. She's a noted educator and has taught at some of the most prestigious universities, Oberlin, University of Massachusetts, Hunter. She's an author. And her first book was in 1986, All American Women. She has always looked for possibilities and options. And, and all of you know about her role as the esteemed president of two historically black institutions of higher education, Spelman and Bennett. And she's chronicled with a seal of excellence for her presidential roles. For such a time as this in the United States, who can speak on diversity and equity and accessibility and inclusion more fluently than our president? And I want to say to you, imagine being the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. Imagine being a senior consultant fellow at Andrew Mellon. Imagine being a special counsel on strategic initiatives at the great Baltimore Mu Museum of Art. Oh, you know she's a superb speaker. You know she's elegant. And she has that special, special way of calling you so encouragingly by your name so you never say no. She lifts others. And yes, she has more than 70 honorary degree degrees and lots and lots of awards, but she's anchored. She's down to earth. She's collegial. She has a, she's empowered with integrity and she's just bursting with African proverbs. For such a time as this, God in his great wisdom has given us just the right person, just the right person to be the president of the National Council of Negro Women. Members who are here tonight, I give you our esteemed president, Dr. Janetta Cole, for her state of the organization message. Dr. Cole. Tech Factory. My NCNW sisters, brothers of the Charles L. Franklin Associates, Sisters and brothers all in our extended family of the National Council of Negro Women. Even though it must be done virtually, I am extending the warmest possible greeting to each of you. It is my responsibility and my joy to speak with you on the state of our organization. With gratitude to our Creator, I am so pleased and proud to say that today our beloved National Council of Negro Women is strong and vibrant. And our organization is strong and vibrant despite the state of our country and our world. For as you know so well, we are living with multiple pandemics. There's COVID-19, 
a pandemic that reveals long-standing health disparities, income inequalities, and systemic racism, along with systemic sexism, that all disproportionately affect our community. We must take a moment now to acknowledge our brother George Floyd, our sister Breonna Taylor, and so many other black women, men, and LGBTQ people who have been the victims of police violence. May their souls rest ever so peacefully. I want to take this opportunity to thank our national chaplain, Reverend Dr. Barbara Skinner, who throughout these days and months of raging pandemics continues to lift up mighty prayers for our NCNW members, our families, our communities, our nation, and yes, our world. Let us take courage. Let us take courage from, from these words that our founder, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune said about her times, for her words are equally applicable during these intensely challenging times that we are living in. Dr. Bethune said, if we have the courage and tenacity of our forebears who stood firmly like a rock against the lash of slavery, we shall find a way to do for our day what they did for theirs. With the courage and tenacity of Dr. Bethune, we have come together in this 59th convention that none of us ever imagined we would hold virtually. But you know, my sisters, the very act of doing so is an expression of the theme of this convention. For such a time as this, a call for resilience and resurgence. Two years ago, when I respectfully stood for election to serve as NCNW's seventh president, and chair of the National Board, I fully acknowledged the work of all of our past presidents, and I do so again today. Of course, I lifted up our unending gratitude for the leadership of our iconic fourth president, Dr. Dorothy Irene Height. I acknowledge the work of our fifth president, Dr. Barbara Shaw. And I said indeed that we are, indeed we are, in the strong and vibrant condition that we are in because of the work of our seventh president and chair of the National Board, Ms. Ingrid Saunders Jones. When Ms. Jones, whom I call my sister leader, would ask, how is NCNW doing? We would proudly reply, NCNW is alive. NCNW is well, and NCNW is solvent. Because NCNW was, as Sister Leader Ingrid Saunders Jones would say, alive, well, and solvent, two years ago I could call for our organization to boldly move forward in two ways. One, 
to make sure that NCNW has a seat at tables where social justice is on the agenda. And two, to do what is required for the National Council of Negro Women to become a more intergenerational organization. My sisters and the righteous brothers who are with us, we have accomplished a great deal in terms of these two goals. We have done so because of the dedicated work of our board of directors and our executive committee because of the dedicated work of our affiliates, sections, and guilds. And yes, the work of the associates and our National Council of Negro Women headquarters staff. There's so much truth in that African proverb that says, when spider webs unite, they can even tie up a lion. During these past two years, NCNW has indeed taken a seat at many tables, tables that were set nationally and in our sections to address a social justice agenda. Without attempting to note each time over the past two years, when NCNW has been invited to such tables, or as Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm said, when not invited, we have pulled up a folding chair to the table. Here are a few of the times when we have been present and accounted for because women's rights and civil rights were on the agenda. A noteworthy example is that Minority Whip Congressman James Clyburn chose to focus his second inaugural podcast on a conversation with me on the life and legacy of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. NCNW was prominently represented when I was asked to speak on the program that the Congressional Black Caucus convened in a hall of Congress to commemorate the arrival in 1619 of enslaved Africans. The arrival of our ancestors on the shores of what was then British Virginia. Yes, NCNW was clearly on a national stage when I spoke at the Women's March. And NCNW had a seat on the float in the Rose Bowl Parade that commemorated the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Sister Executive Director Janice Mathis and I are very involved with an intergenerational collective called Hashtag Win With Black Women. This group is effectively led by young black women from many sectors in our country. NCNW is often invited by the leadership of some of our affiliate organizations to have a seat at tables where social justice is on the agenda. Those invitations are just one example of the important work that Vice President Dr. Thelma T. Daly carries out with our 32 affiliate organizations. NCNW continues to work collaboratively with our long-standing partners, partners like the NAACP, the Urban League, the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation, and the Black Women's Roundtable. 
And we are in the process of establishing a partnership with Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Over the course of the past two months, we have been working closely with two recently organized groups. One of these groups is called Sisters United for Reform. It is a convening of 13 presidents of national black women's organizations. The other group is the United Nations African Diaspora Network, whose board is chaired by our own Honorable Sister Constance B. Newman. I want to acknowledge the dedicated work of Sister Fanny Mullen, who continues to serve as the liaison for NCNW at the United Nations, where our organization has held observer status since 1946. One of the programs that NCNW is involved in is a worldwide campaign to end violence against women and girls. Such an important campaign tied to the United Nations. I should also note that our executive committee approved the signing of a memorandum of understanding with the National Network to End Domestic Violence. As you know, my sisters, you know from the work you are carrying out, NCNW has been fully engaged in nationwide campaigns to encourage black participation in the 2020 census and to mobilize black people to vote. Because our community is among the demographic groups that are traditionally undercounted when the census is taken every 10 years, many of our black communities do not receive their fair share of the up to $1.5 trillion in federal funding, funding for schools, for infrastructure improvements such as roads and safety net programs such as WIC. And being undercounted in the census can also lead to our communities losing political power such as representation in state legislatures and in Congress. To address these very serious concerns, NCNW is in a formal partnership with Fair Count, an organization founded by leader Stacey Abrams, an organization founded to mobilize around the 2020 census. Our particular partnership, that is NCNW's particular partnership, is called Sisters for the Census, a civic engagement campaign that works toward the goal of ensuring that black women, our children, our families are fairly and accurately counted in the 2020 census. Of course, NCNW is intensely engaged with efforts to educate and mobilize black people to vote. We must mobilize ourselves and others to vote as if our lives depend on it, because indeed our lives do depend on it. Drawing on the language of young people, our sister executive director, Janice Mathis, imagined and then organized a program called Adulting 101. The goal of this program 
is to educate young black Americans at our historically black colleges and universities, to educate our young folk about citizenship and to incentivize them to engage in adulting, that is, to be responsible adults by voting. Last week, our first Adulting 101 was hosted by Wilberforce and Cheney Universities. The Adulting 101 video posted on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube has garnered more than 17,000 views since September 17th. We are in collaboration with a number of organizations that are also involved in getting out the black vote, including Ms. Oprah Winfrey's Own Your Vote, First Lady Michelle Obama's organization that is titled When We All Vote, and Get Out the Vote efforts by the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation. Two years ago, the second charge that I issued to our organization was this. The National Council of Negro Women must become more intergenerational. Many years ago, our founder, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, spoke of the importance of intergenerationality when she said this. We have a powerful potential in our youth, and we must have the courage to change old ideas and practices so that we may direct their power toward good ends. As I think about why and how NCNW can become more intergenerational, I'm inspired by the story of how young our, our honorable sister Alexis Herman was when she joined NCNW. And let us remember that Dr. Dorothy Irene Height was 25 years old when she first met Dr. Bethune and engaged with the organization that she would go on to lead so brilliantly and effectively. For NCNW to become more intergenerational requires increasing the numbers of members who are young women. However, that's the easiest part of this highly important process. The more difficult work involves figuring out how to bring together the wisdom of seasoned members and the innovative spirit of younger members to bring them together in a way that is built on mutual acceptance and respect. When that does happen, the result is it's a beautiful and powerful collaboration that is described in an African proverb that says, the young can go fast, but the elders know the way. I am one of the oldest members of our organization, and I am very aware that the long-term vitality and sustainability of NCNW requires that we have a far more age-balanced membership, a membership that is more balanced in terms of those of us that I call our roots and young women who I call our wings. So what progress have we made in the past two years in our ongoing effort to become a more intergenerational organization. Here are just five specific ways that we can see change on this question. One, 
more younger NCNW members are in leadership positions on national committees, and more young members are in state and section leadership positions. Two, in our sister's magazine, there's a definitive increase in the number of articles by younger members and an increase in articles on topics of particular interest to our wings. Three, NCNW now has far more presence on the social media platforms where our younger members are ever so actively engaged. Four, throughout this 59th convention, there will be substantially more involvement of younger NCNW members than ever before. And five, at the last meeting of the executive committee, there was unanimous support of a proposal presented by a group of our wings who have been working steadily with our membership committee. Our wings have named themselves the two Litty Committee. You've got to know their language to get it. They seek to substantially increase the number of collegiate and young adult members who transition into membership and committed engagement in our state and section formations. I am grateful to NCNW members Shara Denton, Ariana Brazier, Arianne Jameson, and Sharon Glasgow for their leadership on this very important effort. And I'm also grateful for the way that the co-chairs of the membership committee, Dr. Lois Keith and Ms. Diane Larche, are working so beautifully and effectively in this collaboration of Roots and Wings. I turn now to address the state of our organization as reflected in a number of specific actions and programmatic initiatives that have been launched and sustained over the past two years. As we continue to proudly and accurately say that NCNW continues to be financially solvent. There is no small amount of work required to make that true, given the challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the constraints caused by that pandemic, under the very able leadership of co-chairs, Ms. Johnny Walker and Ms. Donna Michelle Fields, our Bethune Height Recognition Program continues to bring together NCNW members statewide and honors distinguished community leaders. During the celebratory Bethune Height Recognition Programs, Substantial financial contributions are made to the financial health of the National Council of Negro Women. We have recently launched the President's Circle to engage interested NCNW members in special conversations and programmatic opportunities. Joining the President's Circle requires a $1,000 annual contribution to our organization. These contributions are a source of funds to NCNW, a source of funds that is not constrained by grant requirements. 
I appreciate the many ways that Ms. Summerlin Stovall serves as my special assistant. And I'm especially pleased that she's playing such an important role in the advancement of our president's circle. Last year, under the chairship of Honorable Alexis Herman, our Uncommon Height Gala was a highly successful event financially and in terms of presenting an engaging and meaningful evening program. NCNW's Finance Committee, chaired by Honorable Constance B. Newman, with Treasurer Beverly Beavers Brooks and Assistant Treasurer Dr. Linda Hunt as members, carefully provides financial analysis, advice, and oversight of our organization's budget. And this committee assures that NCNW is operating with the financial resources needed for our programs and services to function well. We're exceedingly fortunate to count among our great assets the Dorothy I. Height Building that proudly stands as the only building owned by black people, specifically black women. The only building owned by black people that is between the White House and the Capitol. Attention to our historic and priceless property is the work of our building committee, chaired by Ms. Daryl McKissick, McKissick, with full engagement by committee members, Honorable Constance B. Newman and Mr. J.C. Cole. The heart of our organization is, of course, our membership. While the COVID-19 pandemic is creating challenges to this highly important component of our organization, those challenges are being met. Thanks to our membership committee co-chaired, as I mentioned a little ago, by Dr. Lois Keith and Ms. Diane Larche. And I want to acknowledge the REACH, R-E-A-C-H, initiative, an initiative to recruit new members, an initiative that is led by Ms. Ariane Jamison. David Glenn, our Director of Membership continues to head our staff's involvement in efforts to recruit, sustain, and grow our membership currently at over 2 million women of African descent. Brother D, as I call him, assisted by our sister, Miss Melinda Todd, they are successfully instituting our new membership database. Over the course of the past two years, we have expanded our headquarters staff with five new positions. We've reassigned one of our treasured colleagues and we've engaged a fundraising consultant. Ms. Crystal Ramsour joined our headquarters staff as NCNW's first Chief Administrative Officer. Sister CAO is supported by her Administrative Assistant, Miss Jocelyn Coons. And how pleased we are that Miss Ramsour is making such a substantial difference in fine tuning how we function administratively and financially. Ms. Michelle Holder, who carries so much of the institutional memory of our organization, is now working directly in Ms. Ramsour's area as our office manager and coordinator of volunteers. 
Attorney Janice Mappis, our amazingly capable and effective executive director, is now able to give greater attention to the heart of NCNW's mission as carried out in our four program areas. And our sister E.D. Janice Mathis joins with me and Ms. Carla Maxwell Ray, our fundraising consultant, in securing funds for our organization. Sister E.D. is ably supported by her new administrative assistant, Ms. Driana Perkins. Thanks to Kevin Johannes, NCNW's Director of Communications, our organization has far more visibility in the traditional media and certainly on social media platforms. Working with Ms. Sandra Green, our in-house graphics designer, Brother Johannes has made our major publication, Sisters Magazine, completely green because it is now only published online. We've recently brought Ms. Kayla Allen onto our headquarters staff as an assistant to our Director of Communications. And this week, Ms. Rosalind Hannibal Booker is joining our headquarters staff as NCNW's Director of Philanthropy. We look forward to the work she will do that will bring long-standing relationships between NCNW and the philanthropic community into fruition. There's an impressive increase in the engagement of NCNW members and friends on committees that I have appointed over the past two years. These include the Committee for the Future, co-chaired by Deborah Walls Foster and Cheryl Poinsett Brown, a committee to draft a vision statement chaired by Vice President Dr. Helena Johnson, the Committee on Board Engagement, chaired by E. Tanya Greenwood, the Fund Development Committee, chaired by Regina Majors, a Committee on Performance Evaluation, chaired by Honorable Sister Patricia Watkins Lattimore. There is the Committee on Young Adult and Collegiate Membership Transition, tri-chaired by Shara Denton, Ariana Brazier, and Ariane Jameson. And of course, as we move into our 85th anniversary celebration, it has been my honor and pleasure to appoint a honorary 85th anniversary committee. Now, during Ingrid Saunders Jones presidency. The associates were formed as a men's membership wing of NCNW. In 2019, the associates were more fully organized under the chairship of Harry Johnson and James D. Staten. And the associates formally adopted as their name the Charles L. Franklin Associates. Programmatically, NCNW continues to be highly engaged around four foci. Four foci that were imagined and carried out during the presidency of our immediate past president, Ms. Ingrid Saunders Jones. The work, the programmatic work of the four foci is now enthusiastically and powerfully under the direction of co-chairs of the program committee, Ms. Paulette Novell Lewis and Dr. Tamara Wiles Lawson. 
In connection with our focus on education, particularly STEAM in Georgia, South Carolina, and New York, as well as in numerous sections, there are activists, there are activities, excuse me, associated with increasing the engagement of black girls and women in STEAM. Girl Tech is a program that attracted a following of more than 2,000 individuals. Last year, we introduced nearly 3,000 high school students to college life during an NCNW tour of eight historically black colleges and universities. Our focus on financial literacy and entrepreneurship is in high gear through the bi-monthly Women's Economic Empowerment and Millennial Entrepreneurs webinars organized and led by our sister executive director, attorney Janice Mathis. In direct response to the current COVID-19 pandemic, we've increased our focus on health disparities that black women experience. And we have launched a new webinar series titled, Healing Our Children. Our deep involvement with public policy and civic engagement is at a high pitch during this period of the 2020 census. And of course, during this period of elections up and down the ballot. We're grateful to our civic engagement and public policy co-chairs, Dr. Elsie Scott, and Ms. Mignon Moore for their guidance in this area. My sisters, my brothers, my siblings all, as I bring closure on this state of our organization, I and you can proudly say that NCNW is fortified by the past. And in addition to our glorious history and her story, we are firmly planted in a vision for the future. That vision includes an anticipated report from the Committee for the Future that will help the National Council of Negro Women to move upward and Onward, I thank you for listening to this state of our organization. And I invite each of you, my sisters, my brothers, my siblings all, come, come let us move forward, doing the work, I dare say, the sacred work of the National Council of Negro Women.